Welcome to the podcast, Scattered, One Person's Search for the Story Behind Human Remains. My name is Yvonne Chorlin. I'm a physical anthropologist and archaeologist. In other words, I like dead people. In this podcast, I explore topics related to the search, discovery, recovery, and identification of human remains. I offer information, perspectives, and insights directly from the mouths of researchers, as well as experiences of people who work with human remains. All of this aims to provide you with valuable information on a subject that isn't talked about, doesn't seem to be a priority, and that is very understudied. I hope you enjoy. I'm Ellen Graytack. I'm the Director of Bioinformatics at Parabon Nanolabs. At Paravon, we are a DNA technology company, which means a lot of different things. But the thing that we're mostly known for is our work in forensics. So we work with forensic DNA from crime scenes and from unidentified remains. And really, we're sort of filling the gap between recovering the DNA and matching it to the person that that DNA came from. We're sort of in the middle there of, well, who should be tested to compare that DNA and get that match, uh, that's really where we come is to, is to try and generate leads from DNA. So how long has Parabon been going and, and how did it all kind of start? Parabon, the parent company, Parabon Computation, I think was founded around 1999. So it's been around for a while and they started out as a, or really are a high performance computing company. This was before the days where you could just you know, spark up an Amazon in, in, instance and do a bunch of computation in the cloud. Uh, back then, networking computers together to do difficult computation was a big deal. And so the sort of idea was um, really like for universities, imagine they've got these computer labs that are sitting there vacant all night. Those computers could be processing data for their scientists. And so that's what Parabon started with. And then I um, my understanding is our CEO, Steve, was, was speaking at a conference and met someone uh, who was working in DNA nanotechnology. And they were saying, we have this really hard computational problem, which is basically computationally figuring out how a sequence of DNA will assemble in, in reality. And then we want to design, you know, drug delivery mechanisms, for example, that are a particular shape. Can we figure out what DNA sequence is needed that will assemble into that shape? And so that's where Parabon Nanolabs came from. They started working on this nanotechnology uh, side, and we still have that side of the work. I'm not involved in it, but uh, we have a lab that is working on developing new treatments, new vaccines, um, using this, this DNA nanotechnology, which is pretty cool. And so it was only um, in around 2011, um, and I should say, I don't know exactly what date that was <laughs> that Parabon Nano Labs was founded. I should know that by now, but. Um, <laughs> Dates. <laughs> yeah. Um, around 2011, um, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, which is a part of the US DOD, they put out a solicitation looking for businesses to propose basically a kit that could predict what someone looked like from a DNA sample. The, the use case that they were envisioning was sort of in theater. I mean, the, you know, this is still Iraq war going on. You collect DNA from an unexploded IED. Can you learn anything about the person who left that DNA if you don't have a database that their DNA is in, you know, can the, can the DNA itself actually generate leads? And so Parabon was one of the companies that responded to this and basically said, well, this is actually a hard computational problem. My understanding is that the other companies that replied said, oh, well, there's this marker that's been published in the literature for light eyes versus dark eyes. We'll give you a kit that can do that. And Parabon said, well, I bet there's a lot more we can do than just that. We'll actually do a research project to find the genetic markers and build them into predictive models. And so Parabon was selected to do this research. And that's really when I was hired. I started in 2012 to run that program to start from, you know, we've got a bunch of DNA and information about those person's appearances. 
can we build a predictive model? And so there were several years where we were just trying to figure that out. It was a research project. You know, what can we say? At that time, it was known you could just see if someone had brown eyes or blue eyes, you could tell. If they had green eyes or hazel eyes or anything else, you really couldn't. And other traits, it wasn't known if they could be done or not. And so that was sort of the first thing we had to do is like, is this, is this even possible? What traits is it possible for? And so the way that we did that was we got access to these large publicly available studies. Um, so these are anonymized data where people have participated in research and signed informed consent that they that the data can be shared with other researchers who are approved. And so basically you get this huge file of DNA data and then along with it, a file of phenotypes. So the pe people's eye color, their hair color, whether their earlobes are attached, whether they have bent little fingers, you know, all sorts, whether they have high arches and all sorts of things. And so that was sort of where it started was, can we find genetic markers that are strongly associated with these traits? And then not only that, but predict them in new people. So we spent about two years developing that and... In, at the very end of 2014, we were ready to start offering it to law enforcement. And there was a kind of a big wake up call between the, de the development, you know, research and the actual application. And that hiccup was forensic DNA. And forensic DNA is just way difficult <laughs> and way, way different from clinical DNA. You know, the, the samples that we've been working with, the data that we've been working with, you know, those are collected from living people who can give you a vial of blood or spit in a tube and give you tons and tons of beautiful fresh DNA. When it comes to a forensic case, you know, that DNA is not fresh. There might be only a little bit of it. And often it's actually mixed between the perpetrator and the victim. So two people's DNA are in that, in that sample. And so that was sort of the first real hurdle that we had to overcome was, well, we know it works if you have perfect data, but what happens if you have a real forensic sample? Can you still make predictions? Can you still make accurate confidence statements? And so we had sort of developed this statistical framework that took into account the fact that with these forensic samples, we were going to be missing a lot of the data. Not a lot, but you know, a good proportion. We're, so we're typing um, about 850,000 SNPs. A SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So that's a specific spot in the genome where, uh, you know, everybody's DNA is made up of A, C, G, and T. So these are sites where some people have an A and some people have a G. And that's what we're looking at. And we might be missing 10 or 20% of those. And we still need to be able to make a prediction for eye color and say, what's the probability that it's correct? And so we had to develop this whole statistical framework. And, you know, one of the first questions we got from detectives was like, oh, well, does it work with mixed samples? I'm like mixed samples? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Isn't it bad enough that you only have two nanograms of DNA? Now you're telling me that there's someone else's DNA in there too? And so we set to work. And one of the things I still remember learning this at, um, at Epcot, I was at a conference and we were at the social event and I was talking to someone from a lab and she was saying, oh, well, we always have a DNA standard from the victim. But, oh, really? Well, okay. So if you gave me mixed data <laughs> and also a single source from the victim, maybe we could sort of subtract out her data and reconstruct what his DNA was. And so I built a model to do that. You know, this was a whole new thing also. So there was a lot of hiccups. Um, and, and one of the first things we found was how to even portray this information to a detective. Because, so, you know, we started selling this, we're going out to detectives and telling them, um, we can tell you with 80% confidence that your guy has blue eyes. How about that? And they would say, 80%. DNA and 80%. No, no, no. DNA is 99%. What can you say with 99% or 95 or 90, you know, with really high confidence and sort of out of frustration. I said, well, I can tell you that he, his eyes aren't brown. Like, yes, <laughs> that, that's what I need to know. Whether they're exactly blue or exactly green doesn't matter that much. But if I can take anyone on my list who has got brown eyes and say, it's probably not them, you're not it 100% couldn't be them, but it's a lot less likely to be them. That's what they wanted. 
the and so that's what we had to yeah. produce yeah yeah okay do you know what i'm gonna stop you just for a moment really and backtrack long. a little bit no it's good oh i can i can hear the passion in your voice holy smokes <laughs> this, is, this is amazing let's just back up a moment because um I don't know exactly who's in my audience, but I'm thinking there's probably some people out there who think that because you have the gene or a gene, it automatically expresses in your body or whatever, because you have the gene, that the genetic equals the phenotype. And that's not the case, is it? That is not the case. Uh, so when we learn in introductory biology about genetics, you know, we learn you know, there's a big A and there's a little A. And if you've got a big A, then, you know, you got a black fly. And if it's little A, you got a red fly or whatever. Right. And, and that's what we call Mendelian traits because they mm -hmm. behave like Mendel's peas. You know, you can cross them and predict exactly what proportions of phenotypes you'll get in the outcome. But the phenotypes that we're working with, these um, human appearance phenotypes, it's much more complicated. The eye color is actually the simplest one um, about 98%, 99% of eye color is determined by DNA. You know, you have your mother's eyes because you have your mother's DNA. And there's this one SNP, this one site in the genome called RS12913832 that some people have an A, some people have a G. I have two Gs, and that is why I have blue eyes. You know, if you have two A's, you're going to have brown eyes. If you have one big A, one A and one G, well, then you'll probably be somewhere in the middle. And that actually gets you about 90% of the way to predicting someone's eye color. But it's still not perfect. There are some people who have an AA genotype, the dark eye genotype. Their DNA says they should have dark eyes, but they actually have another very rare mutation that makes their eyes blue. You know, it's very, very rare, but it does happen. So you can't say 100% of the time I observed an AA and so it has to not be blue eyes. Say, well, it's 99% probably not blue eyes. Got to keep that in mind. And so it gets even more complicated with other traits. I mean, what we're finding is it's not like there's one marker that says you have blonde hair. There are dozens or hundreds of markers that contribute to that. And what if you look at the data, sort of the distribution of hair colors of people with one version of the SNP versus the other, they overlap. And so at the extreme end, you know, if you have very light blonde hair, well, then it's more likely you have this DNA, particular genetic marker, than if you have very dark hair. But everyone in the middle, you really can't know. And that's where the, the prediction difficulty comes in because you see all these publications coming out saying, we found the gene for X. And what that really means is usually these researchers looked at these days, hundreds of thousands of people, and they found a site in the genome that significantly associates with the difference. So for example, think of height. And we see there are the, there's, oh, it's estimated like 100,000 SNPs that contribute to height. And if you find one that is just the strongest height uh, predictor, it'll make a difference of maybe two millimeters, if that. And so it's, <laughs> it's very, very subtle. But if you know all 100,000 of those, you add up all of those two millimeters, you can get somewhere. But still, you know, somewhere in the middle, you're going to have people who are, you know, five foot six, and they're just sort of intermediate on everything. And some, it, it's just, it's not as deterministic as we'd like it to be. Um, and that's because these traits are very common. Um, really, the, those, uh, the things that you learn about in introductory biology where they have a really strong impact, where it's like that one SNP means you have this disease, means you have this trait, um, those are very rare because generally evolution doesn't like things that change the DNA a lot. And so things that change the DNA a lot are, tend to be the things that give you diseases, and those tend to get sort of filtered out of the population. They don't tend to persist. It's, it's these things that have small effects or that have effects that aren't going to affect your ability to have children that, uh, you know, whether you have blue eyes or blonde hair or whatever. Um, those are the things that really most of the variation in the genome is. They're just a lot harder to understand and explain. Absolutely. So 
not only when somebody has DNA, is DNA not labeled with your name and says, <laughs> this DNA equals Yvonne Chorlin. Um, but if you have the DNA, it doesn't equal what you're going to see expressed in that person because there's so many variables that make up each individual trait of every single person. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so the way that we've decided to sort of communicate our results is we've taken, so like going back to eye color, because it's sort of the simplest, you know, you've got blue, green, hazel, or brown, somewhere in there, everybody's eye color. And what we do is we take our predictive model that we've built and we use it to predict on thousands of people where we know whether they had blue, green, hazel, or brown. And so from that, I get a distribution that, okay, when the prediction is at this value, well, 90% of the time that person has blue eyes, but 10% of the time they have green. And if it's sort of an intermediate value, well, you know, maybe it's 40% of the time they have green and sometimes 60% they have hazel or something like that. I mean, it, it really could be somewhere you know, in between those traits, because it's not as simple as just blue or green. You know, there's dark blue, there's light green, there's some um, hazel rings and spots. And I mean, it's all sorts of things that go into your eye color other than just that one description. But in the end, and what we're looking for is just sort of a broad description and a range, and then especially what it's not. So that's where it can be very, that's what we recommend that detectives start with is the, the traits that are very, very unlikely. You start by using that to filter out people who really don't match that prediction. And right. then you can focus sort of within the people who do, but it, it's not going to individually identify. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of people who match that description, but there are also even more people who don't match that description. And so in these cases right. where a detective doesn't have a witness, they don't have a description of this person, no way to know, you know, it could be him or it could be him. It could be anybody. Now we can tell them, well, it's probably not him. It's probably not him. It could be him if he's connected to the victim and, you know, connected to the crime scene and blah, 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 blah. You know, you do, it's something that you use along with all the other investigative information, you know, everything else that a detective does in trying to figure out who that person was. Well, this is just one more piece of information that if they had had a witness, the witness would have told them, but they don't. And so they have to go to this genetic witness. Right. And, and that's, I think a lot of the way with, with science sometimes is you have to exclude what doesn't fit instead of going in with an idea and saying that, that one, and we're going to, you know, that, that's it. You can't expect to nail it right off. It's, it's more of a process of exclusion to figure out what it might be and then narrow it down from there. Yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, when, when detectives come to us, they, they have DNA from their crime scene or from their unidentified remains, and they've typically run it through a traditional forensic DNA database, which means they've gotten a profile, what's called an STR profile. So it uses a different type of marker called a short tandem repeat. Um, but all you really need to know is it's um, a set of numbers that you that is individually identifying. So they've searched in those databases and basically gotten no hit. And so all that they know so far is that their guy is not one of the people in the database. Could be just about anybody else. And so, um, you know, if the DNA can't, I mean, at that point, it's if someone was in that database, we could say it's not them, it can exclude them. But without that one person being in that database, it can't tell them who it is. And so we have to help them get there. Yeah, that, that's just the problem. Everybody thinks, again, you know, that once you've got the DNA, it's labeled with your name and, you know, you just, we've got your <laughs> DNA, we know who it is. No, unless you have something to compare it to, you're kind of out of luck. You're, you're stuck with this unknown DNA sample. You don't know right. who it belongs to. And so that's when, you know, Parabon Labs can come in and say, okay, we know who it doesn't belong to. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, kind exactly. of start process of elimination and narrowing <laughs> it down. Yeah. And so, yeah, detectives use this in all sorts of different ways. You know, it depends on their investigation, what other information they have. Um, you know, so we've, most detectives sort of keep the information inside, like they use it to prioritize their suspect list and, you know, decide who to interview first. Um, 
But other times they've just actually released the information publicly. And we've had a couple of cases where, you know, someone called in a tip and it led to the person. Nice. Um, but, you know, these are the, the phenotyping, the predicting of the physical appearance. It's, it's great. It's amazing. It always gives them information they didn't have, but it's not enough by itself to solve the case. I mean, you st it's just one more piece of information along the, you know, hundreds or thousands of other pieces of information. And sometimes we, we see cases where the detective tells us, well, you know, I've got a description, but I just want to check to make sure it's right. And we analyze the DNA and it's someone completely different. And you have so for 25 years, they've been viewing all the information in this case view through that lens of it's someone who matches this description. Suddenly we tell them it's not. And suddenly, and they, okay, maybe something falls into place. I mean, it, again, it's not the phenotyping by itself, but giving them that extra piece of information. I mean, you know, these cases are, so, are cold for a reason. You know, there's just right. not enough information to find that right person DNA to test. And so, you know, giving them one more piece of information sometimes can be enough. And of course, these days we're doing a lot of genetic genealogy, and that is really the one thing that's solving a lot of these cases. But <laughs> the phenotyping does help because there are times where I can tell the genealogist, well, this guy you found has brown eyes and the person's DNA says they probably have blue eyes. So, you know, maybe keep looking or... Um, you know, we know this guy that has to have bright red hair. Oh, well, there's this set of cousins in this family that happens to have bright red hair. We can focus over there. So, you know, it all really works together to get you there. That's the idea. Right. So you mentioned before about having multiple, <laughs> you know, you're, you, you've got the victim's DNA, but you've got this sample that has multiple DNA mixtures in it. So let's talk a bit about that and possible contamination and what you do in those types of scenarios. And so a lot of the cases that we work, and so here I'm really mostly talking about perpetrator cases. Unidentified remains cases are usually just DNA from one person. Right. But a lot of these perpetrator cases have a sexual component and the DNA that's been recovered was on or in the victim. And so it has her DNA too. And there are laboratory techniques that can help to sort of separate that out, but it's not perfect. Uh, and, it, and it depends on the type of sample that it is. Um, and sometimes they're touch samples. You know, we've had touch samples that are, you know, the guy grabbed her really hard in one place and they were able to swab that and get DNA from it. But again, it's of course going to have her DNA in there too. And so, um, yeah, the first thing we had to do was we we did a, a whole bunch of testing. We took, you know, two DNA samples and mixed them in different proportions and tried genotyping them. I know this is not what genotyping was intended for. It's intended for beautiful clinical samples where you have perfect DNA from one person every time. And so nobody really knew what would happen. What would that data look like? Would it be usable? And so we we're able to look at that data and see, you know what? There is signal from him that if we know what the mixed signal is and what her single alone signal would be, we can sort of subtract them out at certain proportions. So if, if he's only 10% of that sample, there's not enough signal from him to know what his genotype should be. But if he's 50% of the sample, or well, really 40% or more, then we can accurately reconstruct his data. And we've but done that in a lot of cases. Would you be able to say that this isn't just her DNA, there's somebody else in here? Um, That's a good question. Uh, I think, I mean, you can tell when something is mixed, but the, the challenge is that lower quality samples can also sort of have those same issues in the data that a low level mixture can have. And so all you would sort of, if it were at a really low level, you know, if it's like 30%, yes, you can tell that that's mixed. You know, you see the, it doesn't matter the distribution, okay, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if it's just like 10%, it's like, well, maybe the data is a little noisy because it's degraded or maybe it's a little noisy ah. because there's a little bit of other DNA in there. Okay. Okay. So you know that, something's off your, your, your sample isn't quite right whether it's yeah from degradation or contamination or something something something's going on 
But I should say that, I mean, in these cases, they've always pretty much always done an STR profile first. Okay. And so from that, they've been able to assess, is this mixed or not? And so when yeah. they come to us, you know, they are not sending us these samples sort of in, um, in, ex- in seclusion. I mean, it, they, they have other information about them. They've tested them before. Okay. And so they know the approximate um, ratios of the people in that sample. Got it. Okay, sweet. So then with contamination, I'm envisioning, you know, getting a, a, a blood sample from blood splatter. And trying to figure out, you know, if there was, you know, more than another, more than just the the victim and the perpetrator in the room, if there's, you know, Mm -hmm. another person, if they were cut, who knows if there's, you know, somebody else in the room, or, you know, was it somehow contaminated degradation, if you could talk about that, and and if you can detect it, and how difficult it is, Mm -hmm. and the limits of it. Yeah, so things get really tricky once it's more than two people in that mixture. Um, so typically, we, I have done it, but I don't like to because it's, it's, <laughs> I'm not as confident in the data that comes out. But um, you know, if there's a third person, they have to sort of be a, just a really small contributor to that mixture. We really need it to be primarily the person whose DNA we're trying to get, <laughs> you know, his okay. DNA. Um, as opposed to the victim or another person. Um, But degradation is a whole other issue that we come across a lot in forensics. So DNA is a molecule. It's a very, very long molecule. And so when it, you know, in your body, it's constantly being repaired. uh, But once a cell is no longer part of a living creature, um, you know, either because it's been cast off or because the person has died, um, you know, it stops being maintained. It starts breaking down. There are enzymes in the environment that break it into smaller pieces. And so in these cases where it's been cold for 50 years, I mean, think about a case that happened 50 years ago. When we think about forensics today, we think about these guys in Tyvek suits, swabbing everything with gloves and everything, know exactly what they're doing. 50 years ago, DNA wasn't part of forensics. They just collected evidence and so these, these cold case detectives have a really tough job ahead of them. The first thing they have to do is go back to that evidence box that's maybe been sitting in the evidence room at room temperature for 50 years and see, can we even get DNA from this? And then it's, well, is it DNA that's good enough to do these extra types of tests? And so a lot of the work in forensic DNA over the last decade has really been in improving the sensitivity of those STR profile methods and getting them to work when you have a really degraded sample. And so there's been a lot of work in that, less work in what we're doing because, you know, when we came along and let's do SNPs in forensics, people said, why? (laughs) I don't understand (laughs) it. I mean, really, we would go to conferences and say, SNPs, 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 and people say, but that doesn't give you an STR profile. What? what's the point? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. They, they um, need to be shown the application. Yeah. And so uh, that was another thing that we had to overcome as well was, you know, if this is really degraded DNA, what's the data going to look like? Can we work with it? And so one of the things that we found, so we, the, the primary laboratory technology that we use is called microarray genotyping. And it's just this, this little chip that has probes for a whole bunch of SNPs. You, hybridize the person's DNA to it and it tells you what their genotype is at all of those SNPs. It's great for that if the DNA is okay. If that DNA is from bone, you basically get nothing back. And and the reason for that is is twofold. So one is that bone DNA is especially degraded. And second of all, there tends to be a lot of DNA in there from not the person. And so here we're not talking about mixing with the victim. We're talking about the environment, the bacteria, Ah. the fungi, the animals that have been in contact with that bone uh, have left their DNA as well. And so when you're extracting DNA from bone, one of the first things they do is sort of sand down the surface so that they're getting DNA that hasn't been directly exposed to the environment. But bone, it's porous. DNA from the environment gets into it. 
And so uh, we found that for bone and really degraded samples, this other technology called whole genome sequencing has been extraordinarily effective. And the reason for that is that over the last five to 10 years, there has been this amazing new field um, called archaeogenomics, ancient DNA. So you've heard about the Neanderthal genome. Well, okay, that DNA was like 100,000 years old. That is amazing. And so if they can do that, (laughs) if they can do that, we should be able to work with our 50-year-old sample. Exactly, yeah, but, 50 years old, yeah. Yeah, so the techniques that have been developed in that ancient DNA field, we borrowed them and said, you know what? And one of the things that they can do is uh, they use these little, they're called baits, like a fishing bait that you put it into the sample and it binds to the human DNA and then you wash everything else away. And uh, it's amazing, but it still isn't perfect. But looking at our samples, we sort of do a little bit of sequencing ahead of time as like a QC. And so what we found is that more than half of our cases had less than 10% human DNA. So, uh, you know, we say, well, you've got 10 nanograms of DNA. Well, nine of that is from bacteria. Wow. And it's going to get in the way. But after this enrichment for human DNA, now we're getting, you know, 80 to 90% human DNA. And so that's the data that we get back. It's amazing. So it's been extraordinarily successful both for ancient DNA and now for cold cases. We've used this in, I don't know, hundreds of cases. I think we've solved a couple dozen now with uh, whole genome sequencing. So then from that, you've got this tiny little sample that's human DNA. What's the confidence then in applying your predictive model to get a phenotype? Yeah, so we had to do a lot of validation to convince ourselves (laughs) and others that the data we were going to recover was good. And so um, we've again, use these techniques both on the lab side and on the bioinformatics side. There's a lot that we can do in the computer to figure out what that data should look like. And so, you know, what we do is we take data where we know what the sequence should be and sort of artificially downgrade it to being, to looking like a difficult sample and then seeing if we apply these bioinformatic techniques how accurately can we reconstruct the original data? And, wow. um, and so we test sort of you know, how much sequencing do we have to have in order to be able to do that? And we found that we can go down very, very low to when the human genome has been covered by sequencing less than one time, we can still reconstruct the accurate data, which is pretty cool. And so as long as you've got accurate data, well, then it's really just are your models going to be accurate? You know, the, the, it's the data that make everything that is underlies everything. And right. you can't do phenotyping or genetic genealogy without a data set that you're very confident in. Right, right. Yeah, because you're developing the predictive model off of the accurate data, but then to actually use the predictive model, you need accurate data. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like this, yeah, circle thing. So on on that, then let, let's talk about um, the snapshot research study. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds cool because, as you mentioned, just because you've got a per- person's DNA and their genetic profile doesn't mean um, you know what they're going to look like. So how does this help with that? <laughs> Well, so one of the uh, coolest, but also most controversial pieces of what we do is that we predict the shape of someone's face. And the way we were able to do that is we worked with a professor who was studying face genetics, and we collected DNA and um, face scans from over a thousand people. And so these are This is using this very fancy 3D camera where it has multiple cameras that flash at the same time. You sit and it takes pictures of you from the front and the side at the same time and builds it into a 3D shape of that person's face. So we actually have a 3D captured face for all of these people. And we were able to use some math and some genetics to do a decent job of predicting what that person's face looks like. And so we're predicting it on sort of the 
big picture. What does this person's face look like? Not how many millimeters are there between their eyes? What is the angle between their nose? You know, we're not doing it at that level. So when you, you think, oh, well, they're just putting in a facial recognition. No, no. Facial recognition <laughs> is like very specific, like the shape of the eyebrows. Well, you know, it's not in your DNA, like how you pluck your eyebrows. And so, um, but we're able to do a pretty good job. And with unidentified remains, sometimes there's a skull. And so we actually have a forensic artist who's trained in skull reconstruction. So he can combine that with the phenotyping prediction. Uh, and so what we've done is so the, the real limiting factor to getting a really diverse data set is that you have to bring the people to the camera. The camera has to be set up very precisely, calibrated, run by uh, someone who knows what they're doing. And, you know, so it has to be people who are local. And, and what we did for the Snapchat research study was we developed an iPhone app that uses your camera. And so you hold the phone in front of your face, you turn your head left and right, and it makes that 3D model of your face, just like cool. the 3D camera did. And so now we've been able to, we've gotten thousands of people to participate in this study. Um, people who have already had their DNA tested using you know, 23andMe or Ancestry.com. We haven't actually done any DNA testing for this project. It's only existing data. They can submit that. They can use the app that, to capture their face and also fill out. Uh, so they also take like close-up photos of their eyes um, and fill out a, a survey about their phenotypes. Uh, and so we can use all of that um, to try and build new models, to, to try and improve. And, and the goal would really be, you know, someday you could take this app and collect somewhere else in another country, you know, because one of the things is we're, of course, limited to the data set that we have and the predictions that we make. Well, the more diverse the data that went into the predictions, the better we'll be able to do in a variety of populations for prediction. If your models are built all on Europeans, well, then no matter who's who you're predicting on, they're going to come out looking European. And so you need to have as diverse data as possible. But it's like what we were just discussing. If you want that predictive model to work, you need accurate data to make the predictive model. And that's what exactly. you're trying to do is get that accurate data so that your predictive model is as accurate as possible. Exactly. And it's it's very different from the approach that's used by academic researchers. So academic researchers, they're studying, you know, what are the genes for, you know, the number of millimeters between the eyes or, or whatever. And to do that, to really get into the biology of which are the genes, you want as little diversity as possible in your data right. set. You want everybody <laughs> to be Dutch. And uh, because most of their DNA is going to be very similar and only the parts that are affecting, you know, the distance between their eyes, those are the only parts that are really going to be changing. And so you can help, it helps you focus in if you have people who are from all different backgrounds, well, their DNA is different all over the place. So you have to take that into account. And so it's just a sort of a difference. Well, if you just want to be able to publish a paper that says, I found this SNP that's associated with this trait, you know, you want as little diversity as possible. If you want to be able to predict in a, in a real case where you don't know what that person's ancestry was ahead of time, you need as much diversity as possible. So it's just a very different approach to the research. And actually, we find that in biological anthropology, too, because so many of us are trained on European or Caucasian osteological samples. Mm -hmm. And so applying that to a real population that is not just, you know, of people with, you know, non-Caucasian ancestry, but often have mixed ancestry. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're trained to look at bones a certain way, and then you see something where a bone is not that way, well, you don't know what to do with it. So your data is very limited and you really need that diversity in your sample population or the population that you're trained on in order to make a predictive model that can predict accurately. Yeah. And so that's something that we see is one of the most uh, useful things when we're analyzing DNA from remains is often they've been looked at by an anthropologist who's been able to measure all of those ratios and say, okay, well, given this table of data, this is probably a 
person of European or African or Hispanic descent or whatever. And, you know, we can come along and say, well, actually they're like a quarter Japanese, <laughs> three quarters exactly. European yeah. or something like that. And it's like, there's no way you could ever figure that out just from this vault. Like it's just, <laughs> you couldn't. But and again, you're running into that, you know, genetic doesn't exactly equal what mm-hmm. you see in the field. Also type. true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the limitations, but Hey, we're working on it. At least we know we have limitations, right? <laughs> Um, all right, so um, the snapshot research study, is that open to just people in the U.S.? Yes, just people in the U.S., because that's only where we have our IRB approval. Right. So you have to sign a consent form and everything. Right. And um, I, I would love to get into confidentiality and security and all that kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm sure it's confidential. Information <laughs> is confidential. It is, like you say, people um, sign consent forms all that sort of stuff. And it is ethically approved. Yes, it is. It has been reviewed. We'd get to review it every year, the protocols and the data security. And if we ever had a, you know, data getting out or something, we would have to report it and we would have our wrists left and that sort of thing. So we, it's very important to us to be very careful because you know, we want people to feel comfortable participating in these types of research studies. I mean, without the participation of people in research studies, this research wouldn't be able to happen. Absolutely. We wouldn't be where we are right now mm-hmm. with our research. Yeah. All right. So on that note, let's talk about Justice Drive, which is crowdfunding. Yeah. What's so, going on with that? <laughs> one of the things we were fascinated to learn is that people want to contribute to the law enforcement cases in their community and are looking for a way to do that. And we get lots of emails from people saying, you know, we've got this case and I we haven't been able to solve it. And can you work on it? And well, I mean, I wish we could just do it because you asked us to, but of course we need the detectives on board because they're the ones who actually have the DNA. You know, we can't just call them up and say, you know, give us this DNA. We, we want to analyze it. They have to actually be part of it. Um, but with Justice Drive, what we're doing is we're allowing people to, you know, contribute five bucks or whatever you want towards these cases. And so we get detectives to uh, sort of put their cases on the site. And then we also have sort of, and you can, so you can donate specifically to a case or you can donate to sort of a general fund. And so this was all kicked off, um, was it last year or the year before? We we got this award, this forensics award called the Chapman Award for innovation in forensics. And it came with $10,000. And so that is where Justice Drive started with $10,000 from the Chapman Award to help these cases where, uh, you know, the detectives just don't have the funding um, and uh, they just need a little bit of help. Because not only are the, the services um, that you provide expensive, but the detectives, they put in a lot of time, all law enforcement put in a lot of time, a lot of overtime. And yeah, often, you know, and, and there's always new cases that mm-hmm. need their attention. So there just yeah. isn't enough time and money to go around to really yeah. put these in cold case detectives they are just amazing people they are yeah. so devoted even if that case has been cold for 50 years they're still every day trying to figure out what else can we do can we get this closed and so the involvement of the community is very important because that can sort of keep them going i mean if a community stays interested in a case then you know the funding will perhaps continue for that case. And even more directly, when it comes to genetic genealogy, I and mean, we talk about people participating in these research studies, with genetic genealogy, it completely depends on people participating in genealogy databases. And so in the same way that you know you can help contribute monetarily, you can also contribute your DNA to a database like GEDmatch. And every single person who puts their DNA in there, they could change, they could solve a case. You, you don't know. You don't know what you might find when you, when you go on one of those sites. Um, but yeah, one of the things you might be able to do is help solve a case. And you won't necessarily know because the person who gets caught is going to be your third cousin once removed who you've never heard of. <laughs> but, you know, you, you helped us get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as, um, is that for us only, or can anybody in the world contribute to justice drive? Anybody in the world can contribute. Woo-hoo! Mm-hmm. 
And um, we do work a lot of cases in Canada as well. <laughs> nice. I just want to note, I'll, I'll put this the um, link in the show notes too, but people usually aren't aware of how many um, unidentified mm. remains there are. And in Canada, there there is a, a website, canadamissing.ca. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, it, it doesn't specify the number of unidentified. Um, usually I have to, every year I usually book the people in Ottawa and say, so out of this big number, how many of them are unidentified? And usually it's a few thousand yeah. people. I and think in the U.S. it's tens of thousands. There you go. So there's a lot of unidentified remains, usually sitting in boxes or, you know, they might be buried, but the case file is still open. And um, we just don't know who they are. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I talk about us working with detectives, but we also work with medical examiners. Ah. And, yeah. So, uh, for example, in the state of Oregon, um, they applied for and got a grant to basically try to clear out all of their unidentified remains, you know, all the boxes that they had with bones in them. And they've, yeah. we've worked about 50 cases with them so far and helped them solve over 30 of them. And it's just fascinating to see, I mean, cause these are, you know, a, a new medical examiner is coming into possession of these boxes that are not labeled very well. We've had ones that turned out were from someone who had been buried and they just hadn't, they had missed a bone. Um, ones where, you know, it's like we found a cranium. Oh, well, it turns out that was from these remains that were identified five years ago. It's just they hadn't found this, the skull and it had been far away. And so, I mean, this is where the scattered remains come in. They just hadn't connected them together. And so we've helped them work on so many of these cases and give names back to so many of these people. It's just, it's really wonderful work that these medical examiners are doing. Wow. Oh, and the closure for the families and for <sighs> these poor detectives who have been working on these cases for years. Yeah. Uh. And the detectives, they, they, they come, they come and go. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not typically that, you know, one guy is the cold case detective for 30 years of his career. He comes in and does, you know, two years with the cold case unit and then goes back to homicide or whatever. And so it's always sort of a new detective coming in thinking, okay, well, what else can I do that no one else has right. thought of before? <laughs> and so that's where a lot of this DNA stuff comes in. <laughs> Well, you are doing amazing work. Thank you for your your work. Thank you to everybody on your team. And thank you for this interview. Um, is, is there anything that we may have missed that you want to bring attention to in the few minutes we have left? Well, we're seeing these days, we talk mostly about cold cases, but we're starting to see an uptick in actual active cases and people ah. coming to us. You know, I've got DNA from this crime scene. It just happened a month ago put it in a database, it didn't get a hit. So instead of waiting, well, to exhaust all the leads and then see what the DNA can tell you, let's find out now. Let's find out what that guy's eye color and hair color and skin color and ancestry are and help us with the investigation. And so we've been seeing that being, being very effective early on in investigations. But as with everything, it's very important to remember that this is not a photograph that we're producing of that person. It is a prediction and so that's why we insist that when detectives release information publicly, that they don't just release that face. They release the whole page that includes the confidence statements um, and shows, you know, yes, we put this eye color on that person, but it could be a bit lighter. It could be a bit darker. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind um, that it's, it's not intended to be a photograph of that person, but it is intended to be an accurate description. Right. Yeah. Because it's all about using it as a tool in a toolbox of many tools and to help exclude. Right. Other than, yeah. And of course there's so much about appearance that is not written into your DNA, you know, how you wear your hair, how much you weigh, whether you have tattoos and scars or glasses, facial hair, you know, all of those things are not in the DNA. And so we just, we can't know them. And so, you know, it, it's a prediction, but it's only a prediction of these certain traits that we can predict. You know, you can't say, well, that guy had a beard. So can't be him. Uh, no, no, no. We, we just, we don't know where there is bit or not. Okay. So. Right. Yeah. That's just it. And God forbid if somebody dyes their hair. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Great Tech. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. 
I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode. Please leave a rating or review and share this episode and podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Thank you.